Good evening. Hi, everyone. <laughs> We're thrilled to be here and to have you all with us. And we thought when we were discussing how the evening should go, we thought it probably would be a really good idea to explain this, what you're seeing. Juliana um, <laughs> and the Rabbi. <laughs> That's the next book, <laughs> Juliana and the Rabbi. Um, so I'm just gonna give a little brief um, intro into how I met um, Rabbi, I call her Nomi. Um, that's my name. That's her name, <laughs> Nomi. But um, it would feel weird to say Rabbi Levy. But anyway, 24 years ago. Five. <clears throat> I was trying to lie about my age. <laughs> You're right, it was 25 years ago. Um, I was a young aspiring actress in Los Angeles staying with a now ex-boyfriend who had a dog. And of course he wasn't around and I was always taking the dog to the dog park. And I was very lost in Los Angeles. I just didn't feel, I'm a New Yorker, and I felt a little displaced. And I bumped into Nomi at the dog park. And that turned into this incredible friendship. Um, when I asked her what she did, and she told me she was a rabbi, <laughs> I had never met a woman rabbi. I was so taken by it. And for me, um, I'm Jewish, both parents were Jewish, but I never felt a connection to Judaism until I met Nomi. Um, I just had never really been introduced to it by my parents. I knew I was of Jewish heritage, but it wasn't something that was important in my life. And then Nomi graciously invited me to Passover, which I dreaded because I thought the only Passovers I had gone to as a kid, it was just a lot of long prayers and the food was there, but no one was eating. And it was just, I thought, I'm not gonna get through it. And it was such a beautiful awakening to sit at, Rob is, is Nomi's husband, to sit at your table and to hear the story of Passover. And it opened up this incredible world to me that I had been closed off from. And it, for me, being a part of any religion felt, um, it, it just felt, sexist, to be honest. I always felt like women weren't included in the prayers and in the story until I met Nomi, um, and she educated me, and that was the beginning of a very long friendship. <laughs> Just to tell you about the kind of woman, I was telling you about this on the phone the other night, uh, the kind of woman Juliana is, uh, obviously, uh, you all know her as this remarkably talented actor beautiful inside and out. Um, but she's the kind of person that when you invite her to a Passover Seder, she spends the day baking <laughs> macaroons and putting them like little jewels in a wicker basket <laughs> because that's who she is. She could have brought a box of candies and that would have been wonderful, but that's who she is. And um, my son is here, Adi. Um, there he is. He's 24. That's how I know we've known each other for 25 years. Right. But, she was pregnant with Adi. Um, right. <laughs> when you have a baby, uh, many friends, God bless my friends, who brought blankets and clothing from the baby gap and everything that you would need. But this is the woman who hand knit a sweater <laughs> for my baby that I've saved, that he's saved to this day because that's the kind of person she is. And when you get a note from Juliana, it's by snail mail <laughs> and it's handwritten because that's the kind of person she is. She's a person who cares and who lives in her place of goodness. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like I've been blessed for my life now. <laughs> Thank and, you. Um, she was, Juliana was, um, she was at the very first service that we did at Nashuva. She was at the first service. Yeah, and I remember no, you said, you have to come, I'm starting this, this, um, what did you call it then? You didn't, you, you, it was, I'm doing this, a service and we're calling it Nashuva and it's gonna have music and I, you know, slightly in the back of my head thought, oh God, I'm not that religious. <laughs> and 
I went. But I knew you were. No, oh, yeah, you <laughs> did. Um, and I, I remember it was a profound experience, and I don't know where it came from, but just as the music started and the singing started, I just sat there and wept. There's something, if any of you ever get a chance, I actually just said to Nomi backstage, you really need to bring it to New York, because it feels a little mean that it's only in LA, because I think we would all benefit uh, from having it here too. You, you could bring it here. Okay. Let's start that. <laughs> um, but it's a, it's a profound experience without feeling um, boxed in the way I felt religion was. Um, it was freeing rather than feeling constraining. And um, it was a magical experience. It's the only thing I miss about not living in LA is <laughs> seeing you and going to Neshuba. Okay, but we're gonna start because tonight we are discussing your book. We so, are. Yes, we are, Rabbi on the Einstein. And I, I have way too many questions to ask. Um, I'm sure most of you do too. Um, but the first and most important question, I think, tonight about this book is, how did you come to write this book? Yeah. <laughs> um, a number of years ago, I came upon a quote by Albert Einstein. Actually, I always, I think you'd be much better at reading it than me. No. <laughs> or do you want me to read it? I think you should read it, unless okay. you want me to read it, but which I'd be happy has, to, but. I know, she's got that good, you know. <laughs> she's got that good. Please, you give sermons, you're good. Please turn your cell phones off. $100 in the kitty. <laughs> Here's the quote by Einstein. A human being is part of the whole, called by us, universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separate from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. The striving to free oneself from this delusion is the one issue of true religion. Not to nourish it, but to try to overcome it is the way to reach the attainable measure of peace of mind. I read those words, and to me they sounded like they'd been written by a mystic. Yeah. But they were written by a physicist. And I kept what we call in Yiddish davening over these words. And I needed to know more about what Einstein was talking about, what he meant that we're all part of this whole called universe, and that we see ourselves as separate entities, and that's an optical delusion. It's a delusion. And I wanted to know where Einstein wrote this. Was it an essay? Where was it in a book? Where did you find it? Where, where did you see it? I was in the library and I was just leafing through different books and documents and I came upon this quote. But it wasn't clear where it had come from, what the context was. And for some reason, and it doesn't really make sense why I cared or why I started to pull on a string, but I needed to know what he was writing and where he was writing it. And it turned out it was a letter. What sort of letter? It was a condolence letter to a grieving father. What was the name of this grieving father? His name was Dr. Robert Marcus. I could have left it there, yeah. but there was a part of me that needed to go further to say, who was this Dr. Robert Marcus? Why did I care? I don't know. What kind of doctor was he? And I just started, like, just it was an insane kind of search, trying to figure out who was this doctor. And then it turned out that Dr. Robert Marcus was actually Rabbi Robert Marcus. And then I said, wow, he was writing in response to a letter from a grieving father named Rabbi Robert Marcus. And I just needed to know more. Who was this rabbi? What did he say to Einstein to elicit this beautiful depiction of our lives, of who we are, and what causes us suffering in life? 
and what can lead to peace of mind. And it turns out that this rabbi wasn't just any rabbi. He was an Orthodox rabbi <clears throat> who was one of the very first to liberate the Buchenwald concentration camp. And when Rabbi Robert Marcus entered Buchenwald, miraculously, he discovered children there, which was a complete miracle because children were the first for slaughter in the concentration camps. But the inmates preserved these children, hid them, and these children were malnourished. But a 1,000 boys were alive, and Rabbi Marcus made it his business to be their mother, their father, their rabbi, their teacher, their mentor. There was nobody waiting for them at home. They were all orphans. Everybody that they had known had been slaughtered. And he took care of these children. And this was the man who, when he returned to the States after the war, after having brought so much hope to so many children, and by the way, one of those children was no stranger to this building because one of those children was a young teenage boy named Eliezer who looked more dead than alive. But we don't know him as Eliezer. His name was Eli Wiesel. But there's a beautiful segue, um, just if, we don't, if you don't mind, that we're here tonight. This is the first place Naomi is talking about this book and, um, and about these boys. And can you tell the story of what happened to you after your father was murdered and, um, and where your mother brought you? Can I read it? You can read it. It's your book. <laughs> <laughs> but um, first, I wanted to say one thing, which is the daughters of Rabbi Marcus are here with us tonight. There they are. Roberta Liner and Dr. Tamara Green are, are with us tonight. And I just want to say that their father of blessed memory was a hero to so many. And he's, his memory, he's a hero to me. And I pray that in the pages of this book, people will understand what kind of man he was oh. and what kind of soul he was. And um, the reason that he wrote to Einstein, what brought him to write to Einstein was that when he returned after the war, his firstborn child, his beautiful 11-year-old son, died of polio. While he was away. While he was away See. fighting for the rights of, of European Jewry. And as you can imagine, this loss um, threw him into a spiritual crisis that none of us can understand. But a man who had brought hope to so many children had lost his way to hope, was in a spiritual crisis. Yeah. And the person that he turned to for comfort was a scientist was the man who knew more about the workings of this universe than any other individual alive in his time. And those it's are the remarkable. words that, that he received in response. Do we know if Rabbi Marcus knew Einstein? Um, I believe in my research that they had met once, that they had met once. Um, but I, I can imagine many people wrote to Einstein. <laughs> yeah, you know. Yeah. So it, it, it's a remarkable thing that you found yes. the response. Yes. Um, but the book is a search for what exactly was it that Rabbi Marcus wrote to right. Einstein. Well, we're not going to talk about that because we want to. We want you to read it. <laughs> but it's really worth it. <laughs> I can tell you, it's a page turner because it's a real mystery. Um, so in it. It, it sort of 
crisscrosses back and forth into this incredible journey that Rabbi Marcus went on and, and your journey as the reader to find out what it was he wrote to Einstein. Um, that's the gift you're going to keep until you open the book. But um, let's just quickly, because it's, it, I think it's incredibly um, telling that we're here tonight, of all places to be, when you had this experience as an as a adolescent girl, um, when your world came down around you after your father was murdered. And what did your mother make you do? She made me come here. To hear? Ellie Wiesel. So all those years ago, you had no connection. And then this book that took you four years to write, I think. Yes. And took you on this journey. Turns out that Rabbi Marcus was the one who saved him. And I spent a number of years trying to get an interview with Ellie Wiesel. And every time I would call or email, I was told his calendar is, is fully booked, but please try again. And I would call or write and, you know, to his assistant, and I would be told that his calendar was fully booked, but please try again. And um, I, I don't know why I kept writing, but I did. I just, every, I would always remind myself, maybe every month, I would just send a new email. Maybe I sounded she like- She persisted. <laughs> she persisted. <laughs> and then after three years, I got a response. Three he, years? Really? Yes. Three years. <laughs> he'd like to speak with you. So I, I was just shaking the day that I, um, that I had this interview with Ellie Wiesel. And the first question was, do you remember Rabbi Robert Marcus? And Ellie said, do I remember? He said, a man walked into Buchenwald with a Magen David stitched on his uniform. And up to that very moment, for us, a Magen David was the symbol of death. It was the symbol of death to have a, a Jewish star stitched to your garment. And at that moment, it became a symbol of life. And he said, Rabbi Marcus, to us, it was the distance from the earth to the sun. Ugh. And I wanted to thank Elie Wiesel at the end of our conversation. I wanted to thank him for taking the time <laughs> to talk to me. And I was about to hang up because we had talked. But I, suddenly it occurred to me that in life, you should thank the people that you need to thank. And I needed to thank him, not only for giving me the time to share such intimate things about his life, things that he has still had difficulty discussing some 70 years later, but I needed to thank him for a way that he had saved my life. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, I need to tell you something. I assume you must hear this from many people, how you've helped them, but I need to tell you what you did for me in my life. He said, you cannot imagine how moved I am right now. Tell me what happened. And so I began. I grew up in Brooklyn. My father taught me. From the time I was a small child, he began teaching me Torah and commentaries and how to pray, too. He'd take me with him to shul every Shabbos, and I would sit beside him and play with the strands of his talus. I told Ellie about my father's murder when I was 15 years old, and that I was an angry kid, so angry and lost and sad. I said I didn't have a plan for ending my life, but I didn't have any plan for living either. I was only 15 years old, and I felt like I had come to the end of things. My father was gone. My weather wasn't the same woman anymore. The Sabbath wasn't the same. I wasn't the same. Prayer? How could prayer be the same? And what good was God anyway? I said, at that lowest point in my life, my mom saw that you were giving a lecture 
and she asked me to go with her. I didn't want to go, but she encouraged me, and I went. It was a freezing cold December night, and we took the subway from Borough Park all the way up to the 92nd Street Y. I told Ellie, I walked into this massive auditorium full of old people, <laughs> and I so didn't want to be there. We were sitting in the second to the last row, and I so regretted that I'd agreed to come to this thing. But then all of a sudden, the lights went down, and you walked on stage and sat down at a desk with just a spotlight on you and began speaking. At first, I was daydreaming as you spoke, but then your words began to seep into my well-defended heart. Yes, your words were sinking in, the kindness of your voice. And your hands, they were performing some sort of ballet in the dark. It was as if your hands were doing a performance to the words you spoke all on their own. I remember being transfixed by your hands and realizing it was the first time I experienced beauty since the day my father died. I was mesmerized, watching and listening to you, a man who had been to hell and back, and seeing you offer beauty to the world gave me some sort of spark of hope. And somehow that night, you opened a door for me to step through. That night was the beginning a first step in many steps that would lead me back bit by bit out of the depths that had threatened to overtake me. Many years have passed, and I've had many causes for joy, and I want to thank you for teaching me that there was hope in my future and that I would have cause to celebrate and to give thanks. I said to Ellie, a man stands in front of an auditorium of hundreds of people, and he has no idea that he's opened a new door for some lost 15-year-old kid who's listening and taking it all in. Ellie said to me, you cannot imagine how touched I am. Yeah, light stuff. That's a magnificent story. And it just came full circle. And, and that's what this book is about. It is. It's about coming full circle. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions, so I got to, I had the privilege of reading the book um, before it looked like this. Um, and I couldn't put it down. Um, I, I found it, because it's not just about the story of Rabbi Marcus and Einstein and these Buchenwald boys. It's also wonderful stories about um, Naomi's uh, congregants, people that she's helped, and their stories, and her own story of struggle, of, of moments uh, where she had to find her strength, um, finding out that she had to have all these surgeries on her nose la two years, last year. Last, exactly a year Last ago. year, right. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't a, a pretty thing at all, but but finding this inner voice. And, and it's, it's about talking to your soul and listening to your soul. So one of the things I said right after I'd read it the first time was, what did you hope to get once you finished the book? What was your hope for the book? How, how would people perceive it? Because it had, and it's not just because I know you and love you, but it, it had a profound effect on me in a way that um, a girlfriend of mine had come to visit me and she was going through a tough time. And I had, I, I had the book by my bed and I had finished reading it and I would underlined all these passages in it. And the second she showed up and I could see her distress, I, it, I didn't even think about it. I just said, you have to read this book. This is gonna help you. That was my reaction to the book. So that's why I said to you, um, what was your hope for the book once you went through this very long journey to get there? And I mean, that was exactly what I said. I said, my prayer is that this book will help people. Um, life 
even just our daily lives, can take us very far from where we hope to be. Uh, you know, you get up, you go to work, you come home. You get up, you go to work, you come home. And sometimes, uh, you know, you wake up one day and you realize that you've drifted very far afield from where you believe you were placed here to be. Mm -hmm. And I think the book is all about listening to that deeper and higher voice that I believe is planted inside of us, a voice that is our compass, a voice that is our teacher. It's called the soul. And um, it's here. It's so wise. It's so strong. And um, I think the tragedy of life is that the soul is so near and yet so far from us because we're experts at ignoring it, denying it, suppressing it, running from it. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's, there's a, I had to, I had to, um, there's a great passage that you wrote, um, which I, of course, I saw it in, in terms of a screenplay. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this would be a great scene in a movie, um, which is when you were struggling um, alone in your bed trying to heal. Um, you, you I'll wrote. I'll just to say, I, I, I just explained, as Juliana alluded to it, but I, it turned out that I had a tiny, tiny, speck on my nose last year and when they went to remove it it turned out that it was the tip of an iceberg and um, I lost a lot of my nose which is kind of funny in a way because it's your nose but um, it wasn't <laughs> you know because it's like you know it's from sleeper right isn't that the Woody Allen movie yeah with the where nose? the nose ends up on yeah. the street and they um, <laughs> but but uh, <laughs> you know it, it's not funny because if it would be my arm you know it was my face and it was cancer um, but the bottom line is, OK, keep going. <laughs> I'm going to keep going. Yeah. Um, although one of my favorite um, things that Nomi <laughs> says is she said to, to the, the surgeon who had to, had to do reconstructive surgery, they had to take the nose off and put it back on. She said, but I love my Jewish nose. And I said to her when she called me to tell me she had to have this done, I said, do you know how many women in Los Angeles are getting their nose chopped off so they can have a new nose. You're the only woman I know who loves your Jewish nose. I did. Uh, it was a yeah, great it, Jewish nose. It was, a, it, it was. It's still great. And he okay. did a good job. He did but a good job. On page. Um, he did. He did, right? But just so you understand, it did wasn't. He, he did. did. <laughs> it wasn't just one surgery. It was six, I think. No, six. no, no. It was the, the original surgery to remove the cancer, and then three more. And then three more. Three so more surgeries. Painful, painful time. OK, so, so I, ha I have to read this passage. OK. Um, so this is on page um, 252. And you talk about this incredible awakening that you had about listening to your soul. And you write, and I, I love this, you write, a guest came to hang out with me in my own head. I didn't even recognize her voice. She was so sweet. She was saying, it's OK. You don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything you don't want to do. Eat something. Do nothing. Take a nap. Just give your body a chance to do what it needs to do to heal. And don't worry about anything. Be kinder to yourself. And um, it was the voice of my soul. And I thought that was ha how often it is that we're so harsh on ourselves. I know for me anyway, I'll only speak for myself, but I'm so judgmental of myself. Um, not so much of other people, but I beat, beat myself up all the time. And when I read that passage, be kinder to yourself. Like you, you heard someone taking care of you, and it was you. Yes. And so I'm, I'm fascinated to think, is that your soul? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I think that often, you know, uh, it's going to be the high holidays uh, sooner than I'd like. <laughs> um, and uh, we talk in, in, our, in our tradition a lot about soul searching. And I think we often make the mistake when we soul search that it's all, sorry, microphone. I have sin, uh, you know, it's not that we shouldn't recognize our flaws. 
But if the voice that you hear says, I'm no good, I'm a bad wife, I'm a bad mother, I'm a bad friend, I'm a bad child, I'm ugly, I hate my hair, I hate my face, I hate my nose. <laughs> um, that's not soul searching. You haven't touched your soul, you've just bumped in to a judge. And the voice of your soul is a voice that says, listen, you've made a mistake, you can fix it. Right. You fell down, guess what? You can pick yourself up again and try again. That's the voice of the soul. The voice of the soul is always leading you to honesty, but with kindness, with kindness. Yeah, you, um, there was something that you, you wrote. Um, it was the voice of my soul, I'm sure of it, and because of your time of, your time of imprisonment became your place of liberation. Yes. Um, and that, so, so uh, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I'm trying to um, meld these two stories together. So we have this incredibly profound story about Rabbi Marcus and Einstein's res response and how this all started and then learning about these boys and about the beautiful women that ended up taking care of these boys. I mean, there's so many oh my God. twists and turns in the book and yet, just I read that the other night, and um, about you know this this place of liberation. If you listen to your soul, and 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 where do we go from there? And there's this other chapter that I want to touch on about forgiveness, um, that awakened me to to my own um, toxicity I was feeling because my neighbor upstairs flooded my apartment for the third time, <laughs> and I kept saying, well, it's not Texas. I feel so, you know, I'm so lucky and it's just a flood in my apartment for the third time. <laughs> and I really kept trying to just focus on other people's sorrows and woes and how can I even, I'm so lucky, you know, and I have insurance and I can move and blah, blah, blah. But every night at 3 a.m. I would wake up with a monologue and my teeth gritted at the anger I felt to this guy who had hired cheap contractors and never fired them after the first flood and how, and I would play out the scenario of how I was going to punish him every time he walked into the lobby. That's not the soul. Right. <laughs> not the soul, not a place of liberation. It's toxic and it was keeping me up at night. And then I started to read these passages over again and jotting down notes for this talk, and it hit me. I mean, I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a little slow, so it took me a little while. I should have known the first time, but it, uh, my apartment. We should all be so slow. <laughs> well, it just hit me. I went, oh my God, if you forgive him, you'll sleep. <laughs> if you, he didn't mean it. It was his contractor, whatever. No one meant to make your life miserable. You're making your life miserable by having such angry, horrible thoughts about a man you don't even know. Although, because I was in my pajamas when I found the flood, he knows me a little intimately because I went up in my pajamas, <laughs> forgetting that I was in my pajamas. But there is, there was this incredible freedom <laughs> in letting go of my anger yeah. and realizing that it wasn't helping anyone. Yeah. And actually rising above it in forgiveness and, and being able, mind you, I haven't even seen him, this is all in my own head, but being able to forgive him from afar, I'm, I let go. And I slept great for the first time. So, but there is, it, it's this incredible life lesson of things that are right in front of you, but you don't see them. No, and they can destroy us, mm -hmm. or we can find the path through. Um, I, I'm thinking two things. The, the prior discussion we had, I just wanted to just share a verse from the prophet Jeremiah, and actually we recite that verse in the Haftarah Meshashana. Um, when, when you were saying about how a situation that you don't want to be in can actually be your teacher. And Jeremiah says, that 
It's possible to find grace even in the wilderness. And that that's part of the challenge in life is to understand that even the situation we dread, even the situation we hate, can also be a precious situation for us. Even while we're going through it, it can be precious. And um, I think that the story that, that you wanted me to talk about a little bit in, is a, a story in the book about a very dear friend of mine who, and, and I, I, I know when we spoke about it uh, earlier, that you were just saying we can all relate to this. Oh my God. Um, I call it the was, forgiveness. It's yeah. the forgiveness stuff, yeah. She was, um, you know, driving one day and was just like one of those days in life. You're driving, you have your kid in the back seat and in his car seat, you're running errands. And all of a sudden, the cell phone that was on the console between the two front seats, the cell phone dropped, and she reached to get it while she was driving. And there was um, a man in the crosswalk, and she hit him. And he died. And this wonderful woman, wife, mother of three, all of a sudden, her life came crashing down. And she came to me, and we kept talking about that one issue, forgiveness. How do you find forgiveness? How do you find forgiveness from above, from God? How could she ever find forgiveness from the man, Jack, whose life she had taken? And would she ever receive forgiveness from his wife and from his son. And um, the miracle of this story is, first of all, I talked to her about what Maimonides said, that when you harm someone, you can, and I'm telling you all of this before Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, you can go to their grave and ask for forgiveness. And she said, I can do that? I said, yes, it's a Jewish tradition that you can do that. And it took many years. And she would ask, and she would ask, and she would pray. And she said to me something that I think was so powerful. She said, Naomi, all the years I would come to synagogue, I was reading words. I thought I was praying, but I wasn't praying. And now I know that every prayer was written for me. Every word in the book is written for me. That's what it means when you hit your soul. When you come up against your soul, you suddenly are taking the words in instead of just having them wash over you. And some three years later, she was able to meet with this man's wife and his son. And together, there was forgiveness. And there was the blessing of Shehechianu. And at that moment, when this man's wife forgave her, she looked up and she said, you know, Rabbi, because the rabbi was there, she said, I'm ready now to have the unveiling. She hadn't been able to put up her husband's tombstone. And forgiveness was the blessing or the gift that she gave herself to be able to have the blessing of closure. Yeah, and, and, and then your friend ended up, she gives talks she now. Gives talks. I mean, she gives talks. It changed her life. Yes, it's, she's, she's a remarkable woman. And she gives talks everywhere about what we need to do and how, unfortunately, and we all know this, how our cell phones, even though we're on Facebook Live right now, <laughs> right? But how our cell phones, how our smartphones are taking us away from life and how dangerous they can be and how mindful we have to be of where we are in life and who we're with. Right, but I think there, there's also this um, incredible uh, 
the, the woman in the book, in the book her name is Rachel, but that's mm -hmm. not her real name. Um, and, and what you went through lying there in your surgeries, not being able to sleep and having to just be with yourself, you, you write, um, which I think is something every single one of us at some point, I mean, usually once a year, at least for New Year's resolutions or whatever it is, but you, you go on to say that the challenge in life is not that you can change. The challenge is can you remain changed? And I'm sure, you know, every single, I know I always say, okay, this year I'm going to do this, and you, and you do it and you feel great for two months. You know, I see it at the gym, at the first of the year, every year the gym is packed, but I know it won't last long. And sure enough, three months later, no one's there. I am, because I enjoy it. But, but, but that, it, it's those New Year's resolutions. Can you, you know, say, I, I am gonna change and I'm gonna stay changed. And what happened to your friend Rachel is not only did she stay changed, but she used the experience to help others. And, and I, I, I spoke with her and she said, all I ever wanted was for things to go back to normal. Right. But then I realized there's no way to go back. All we can ever do is to go forward, higher and higher. That's actually the theme of the High Holy Days, le'ela ule'ela, higher and higher. That's it. And actually, there's a little passage in the book uh, at New Year's, actually, I was talking to a friend of mine, and I said, so did you make a resolution? And she said, ugh, I don't want to talk about it. Mine never come true. <laughs> and I said to her, I started laughing. I said, that's one of the funniest things I've ever heard. Like, you're laughing. I wasn't laughing at her. I said, a resolution isn't a wish. <laughs> it's not a wish. A resolution is really a covenant that you make with yourself. Right. And we all have that issue that we need to face, which is, will it be a permanent change? Teshuva, the Hebrew word, teshuva, right? It really is about, are we making a permanent change? Or are we just you know, trying something out and then falling back into old patterns? And I think that that's really, at, at, at bottom, what I'm talking about in this book is how can we make lasting change and be true to the vision and to the voice of what we know is possible? Because I think often, I think all of us, is, every single one of us here is well aware that in some area of our lives, we are living well beneath our own potential. I think that's um, a beautiful point to take some questions from the audience. Awesome. Awesome. I'm from Brooklyn. And I, uh, we could tell, honey. You could tell? <laughs> <laughs> you mean all these 26 years in LA, I haven't? Uh... No. <laughs> I mean, maybe it's lessened a little, a but little. It, it's it. fabulous. That's okay. why I, I felt like I was home. That's, oh, good. Okay. That's why I fell in love with you. I was like, oh, New Yorker. <laughs> okay, so um, we took some questions from the audience, and can I just say one thing? Because yeah. I was thinking about this as Please. we're talking about listening to the voice of your soul. Yes. Well, I don't know how many years ago it was, but I know somebody who turned down some. <laughs> Oh, I don't know, maybe $20 million or so? 27. <laughs> I know somebody who turned down um, $27 million or so because she was listening to the voice of her soul. And people around her thought that she was immature or a child or foolish or didn't know what was what. But when I knew about this situation, I knew she was listening to the voice of the soul. And when you listen to the voice of your soul, you're bold. And it doesn't matter if other people laugh at you or if people think you're insane. Which they all do. It doesn't matter because you're following your truth. And let's just say, I think it worked out OK. <laughs> but that was an incredible moment. Um, uh, because, and I'm so grateful I had you 
in my life at the time I was in LA doing ER. And um, everyone said, you'd be crazy, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, my contract was up, and I had this moment of, but, but I was going home. I had a, a playwright had written a part for me. I was going to do this little play at Lincoln Center. I thought, you know, this is my dream. I was, you know, I didn't have a kid or a husband. I, I, I had money in the bank. I'd been on the show for six years. And everyone's telling me to do it except my father and you. And I went one day to the Bodhi Tree bookstore, which I don't know if it's there anymore. I don't know either. I haven't been there in a while. Yeah. Okay. But, um, and I just went down the, the, the book shelves and picked a book that looked good. I didn't know it. And I brought it home and I shut my curtains. It was called Einstein the Rabbi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but this is a true story. I closed my eyes and I opened the book and I went like this. And I looked down and it said from this um, uh, Buddhist who had written this book, uh, Surya Lam Das, it said, I realized my mission in life was to learn more, not earn more. And it was an incredible moment. And, it, and I feel like it, something led me to that book. So I didn't shop in that bookstore. Something led me there. And I went, done. Amen. Yeah, exactly. And I, I think, you know, like that's um, an extreme example. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think in every one of our lives, we can all look at something and say, in what way am I selling myself short? by choosing vanity of some sort, because the ego will take us very far away from where we really need to be. Mm -hmm. And in what way am I selling my own soul short by listening to the ego instead of trusting that deeper, higher compass that's here to lead us to where we need to be? Right. Well, on that note, we're going to take a few questions. So this is all from you guys, and i um, not sure whose is whose, but um, in the book, you talk about oh, somebody read it. the difference between a selfie and a soul fee. Oh. Explain. <laughs> Explain. <clears throat> well, we all are very good at taking selfies, aren't we? And. Um, I thought a lot about selfies because selfies, um, selfies tend to exaggerate how great our lives are. Um, they are always disproportionately happy and sort of a projection uh, about something, some, some often a projection about life. And they're always out of proportion too because you might be standing in front of this gorgeous vista. Uh, <laughs> And in a selfie, you're disproportionately large, and the vista is just a tiny speck in the background. And it occurred to me that we're all pretty good at taking selfies, but what we need to learn in life is how to take a soul fee. What's a soul fee? That's really what the, what I, what the whole book is. A soul fee is our daily attempt to understand the contours of our own souls, to understand why we're here, what we're about, and what our wisdom is. Actually, um, I think I have it here. There were four questions that I ask that help you to take a selfie. So do you want them? So this is actually, it's great, it's Elul, it's great preparation, Rosh Hashanah is two weeks away. Number one, what has my soul been trying to say to me that I've been ignoring? Number two, what activities and experiences nourish my soul that I don't do enough of? Number three, going back to forgiveness, what does my soul want to repair that my ego is too stubborn or too fearful to repair? And number four, what does my soul want me to reach for? The answers to these questions will deepen and enrich our lives. The answer in part is our life, or at least the part that matters the most. I didn't know somebody was going to ask that. I, I thought I would raise it myself, but somebody did that for me. So thank you. That's awesome. OK, a few more. 
In the book, you ask, what role does the soul play in finding a sustaining love? Elaborate, please, about soulmates. Uh, Sweet. Soulmates. You know, uh, in Jewish tradition, there's something called bashert, which means the one you're destined to meet. And uh, in Jewish mystical thought, we're taught that every soul uh, first is a compound being, and then the two souls, the two, the pieces get ripped apart, and we enter this world searching for that other part that was originally a piece of us. And finding your soulmate requires a few things. First, it requires openness, open eyes, open heart, open arms. And second, it requires um, shortening a list. <laughs> shortening that list of requirements that we think we know what somebody ought to be in order to find that one who's meant for us. Um, is there only one person meant for us? No, I don't believe that. Uh, that's why it's possible to remarry after a divorce or to remarry after a death. There's life after death, for sure. But to find your soulmate, I say, when I, when I counsel people who are looking for a soulmate, I say, look for someone who makes you feel like home. When it feels like home, it's right. Mm. That's good. You like that? I do. I like that. Um, and, our and, and I just have to say, when I met my husband, um, um, you know, he was like, he was in ripped <laughs> jeans and flip flops, and I was like in an Ann Taylor suit. And um, I think if I would see his profile, I don't know that I would have said, this is the match. This is my match.com. <laughs> And I think uh, the first date we had, if people would see this, I don't know, this woman in a little Ann Taylor suit and this guy in the ripped and the t-shirt and the flip-flops, they would say, mismatch. Um, but the minute we sat down together, I knew I was home. I was home. That's a lucky feeling. It is. And we're both lucky in that. <sighs> we're lucky in love. Yeah. Um, last question. Does, are. I, love the, I love how you pose this question. Does the rabbi believe <laughs> in reincarnation of the soul? That's an interesting question. Yes, I do. Uh, and it's not just I believe it. Uh, there's a whole Jewish mystical uh, tradition uh, called Gilgul. And Gilgul is um, the transmigration of souls, that souls... Uh, return. They, they return. Sometimes the soul returns uh, because it has still work to do on this, on this earth. And sometimes what I love is that the soul returns because it is so blessed, like the soul of a tzaddik, the soul of a righteous one, will return, but not like as a, as a single entity, but as sparks a, a, across many souls, because it has come to elevate. It's come here to elevate. Can I say something political, or is that like really goofy? I've been saying it all night. <laughs> say it. I, I, you know, in you know, uh, me and my husband. Ha I don't. I don't want to say. Okay. Um, there's something called a dibik. Some of you may have heard that word. A dibik is the possession by an evil spirit, and it's. <laughs> what? Wait, I didn't say what I was going to say yet. Uh, come You're already. <laughs> So a divic is when a soul, a person gets possessed by an evil spirit, and it's, it's uh, not very pretty. But there's something else, a different kind of possession, and it's called an ebor. And an ebor is when a person who's not so great necessarily gets impregnated with a holy soul. And that's my prayer for our president. <laughs> Only you could say that so sweetly. I only wish for him the sacred blessing of being 
impregnated by an Ebor. Me too. Amen. Amen. Um, that, you're incredibly gracious. That was very gracious of you, and we'll all make that prayer tonight. Uh, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Okay, so um, I have to do one, uh, I have a duty up here, not okay. just to have fun with you. Okay. But I just want to remind everyone that next door, um, Nomi will be signing books, and you can buy them um, next door as well. They're out um, after the talk. So I just want to remind you. I know they said that in the beginning, but we've covered so much ground. I just wanted to remind you. Um, is that, do you feel good? Do you want me to, uh, I, I, I've I, been I, skirting around certain things because I don't want to, it's also a mystery and you don't want to give the punchline away, you know? So I, I want to make sure that the content, um, that you understand what this book is about for those of you who haven't read it and, and that you also still want to turn each page. So I don't want to ruin the, the, the story um, except to say that it's uplifting and um, incredibly inspiring. And, and also I have to say um, to Rabbi Marcus's daughters how proud you must be to have known a man who was so selfless and um, they, they didn't know him. Oh, you um, didn't know Rabbi, him. Well, he died at 41. Oh, oh um, right. But that's what well, doesn't matter. He's right on your shoulder. But how proud that this was the man who was your father. Be because um, you write about these boys. It's so profound. I mean, I was these boys were given up. They were called delinquents. No one want no. They were given up for for dead, basically. Yes. They were filth. They, no. were, they were considered irreparable. Right, that was the word, irreparable. And he... He believed. He believed and he raised them up. And it's that one, it's that moment in life, and I think in the political arena that we're in today, where you can say, it actually just takes one. Yes. You know, and I think and it's a very uplifting story to know that we can change people's lives. Yes, we can, and I, I love when I was interviewing this one boy. When Rabbi Marcus came to visit these boys in the orphanage after he had taken them from Buchenwald and taken them to an orphanage, he said, the rabbi restored us to our souls. That's a pretty amazing gift yeah. that lives on and on and on and on. Well, we need more of him. Yes, we do. We do. Um, but thank you. Thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you. Can I bless you all? Yes. May God be with you. May health and strength sustain you. May wisdom and kindness enrich you. May nothing harm you. May you be a blessing to this world. May this be for you a sweet year full of health and joy and goodness. And may you be a blessing to this world. Amen. Amen.